you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. On today's episode, Valerie and I look back over season four and discuss what we've learned about the middles of stories and subtext. And we'd love it if you could give our show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Simply go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. All right, Valerie, why don't you start us off by telling us what your big aha moments have been with respect to the middles of stories? Well, I have to say there is so much more to writing the middle of a story than meets the eye. (laughs) There are, there's a lot of concepts and unfortunately I didn't get a chance to get through all of them, even though I did 10 whole episodes. That's how big it is. Now, in saying that as my little disclaimer, the big, if it's an aha moment, but the, the, the concept I want to underline here and I, the thing that I want everyone to remember is that it's the middle of a story where the character's arc happens. So. In act one, we see the character in the quote unquote before state. In act three, the last act, that's when we see the character in the after state. Act two then is when the change happens. So the main character enters act two as her before state self, right? And by the end, because of the journey she's gone through in act two, She's ready to change. And this is why act two of a story is at least 50% of the whole story. Because for the change in the character to happen in a way that is believable and that the audience is going to buy, it has to happen incrementally. Because I think back to uh, Groundhog Day, where the change happened very quickly at the end, and it was a bit hard to believe, but because of the type of story it is, mostly a comedy, you kind of just went with it. Really what we need though, is to have enough room, enough, enough storytelling space to show that change happening bit by bit. So when the character gets to that big moment at the end of act two, when they're, they hit this all is lost moment or dark night of the soul, which means they are as far away from their object of desire as they can possibly get, and they realize the only way they're going to get what they want is to change, that aha moment for them, that light bulb going on for them, that epiphany makes sense. And we buy it because we have seen it happen bit by bit. So that's the, to me, when you're thinking about crafting the middle of your story, that's the real nugget of information that we've got to cling to. I mean, obviously, yes, there are exceptions. We saw that with four weddings and a funeral, but you've really got to know what you're doing there. And even then, Melanie Melanie and I disagreed uh, as to whether or not uh, Richard Curtis really did pull it off. And, you know, if if Richard Curtis is having trouble with it, you know, we mere mortals um, are really going to struggle. Anyway, Melanie, I think that's everything. Uh, what about you? Yeah, well, I I agree, and I with exactly everything that you've said there. And I thought the strongest middles that we saw this season were the ones that remained focused on their controlling idea or the premise of their story. Um, the other aspect of craft that stood out to me this season was especially for successful stories was to provide that bridge like you mentioned between the before and after state and you could really see that with some of the movies that we that you picked this season however I thought the best examples to learn from were actually the ones where it didn't quite work and while there haven't been uh, train wrecks this season 
I think Coraline, Stormboy and La La Land have been um, the best examples of where we see disconnects in the middles. Now, in Coraline, the middle didn't work for me because the story swapped genres and it was like watching two different stories that were glued in the middle somehow but had the same characters in it. You know, the premise established in the book Coraline is rock solid and should have been the north light for the visual storytellers um, when they were writing their story, in my opinion. The first half of the movie did not stick to the conventions of a horror story. In fact, sequences three and four were delightful and pretty. And by the time we arrived at sequence five and six, where the true horror of Other Mother is revealed, we were discombobulated because the story turned into something different. Now, Stormboy's middle for me suffered from a few things, including dueling storylines between old Michael and Michael as he was known when he was young, Stormboy. It also missed opportunities to create conflict in the Stormboy storyline. Now, La La Land was the most disappointing movie for me from a middle's perspective. You know, the movie was saturated in subtext, motifs, resonance, colour, fantasy, you know, the whole shebang. But it suffered from a lack of storytelling or strong storytelling in the middle. So the biggest aha moment for me this season wasn't from our topics of study. (laughs) It really came when we were watching La La Land and it was when you asked me if we were watching the same movie. Um, And then I realised that uh, when you and I are focused on very different aspects of storytelling, so you were looking at a structural aspect and I was looking at a very specific content aspect of the story, that we saw different things. And that was a light bulb moment for me this season. So I think it's worth remembering that when you're editing your own work, there is power in focusing on a specific aspect of your story to get that right. And then you also need to use multiple lenses. But, and this is important, the most enjoyable stories are those where all the different elements of craft are aligned and support the genre or the story premise. And this became obvious to me during your study of middles this season. All right, Valerie, so do you have your summary of best advice for authors? Yeah, it's really easy this season. Do yourself a favor and make sure that the second act of your story is at least 50%. Make sure you give yourself enough room to dramatize the change in your character so that your reader goes with you and believes it. Uh, I, I know it's more words to write, but you're better off shortening your first act and your last act as opposed to increasing the word count of, of your novel as a whole. Anyway, so that's all I have to say. Make sure that at least half of your book is the middle. All righty. So this season, Melanie, you t- studied subtext. What did you discover? Oh, well, like you, I felt that I did not do this topic justice in 10 episodes. Um, It was a big, a a very big um, topic to try and cover. And in drama, more than any other art form, things are not always what they appear to be. People don't always say what they mean. And when stories are told well, there is what's said or done, and then there's the truth of the action and the words. So, yeah, subtext is a massive topic just by looking at it that way. And I think it reaches into all areas of storytelling. In fact, and I said this at the top of the season and I'll say it again, I think it's a fundamental concept that all writers must understand. And why? Well, because it's through subtext that we tell the story without overtly telling the story. So subtext operates at the micro level and at the macro level of storytelling. And we saw this in Back to the Future where time was represented by time travel and the time-space continuum and what could happen if that was altered in any way, as well as the minute-by-minute race against the clock to get Marty back to the future. 
Now, stories also have messages and sometimes there are intended messages and sometimes there's some unintended messages. And when we look into who is taking action and what sort of action it is, as well as who isn't taking action, we can start to examine and understand character development. And when I think about the most powerful characters we've seen this season, I think of M in Skyfall, especially when she's standing next to the coffins with Union Jack draped over them. And I also think of Fletch as a psychotic conductor in Whiplash. Now, why M is the personification of British stoicism and pragmatism, she clearly has a favourite child in Skyfall. And if you don't know what I mean by that, please go back and listen to that episode because I think that was one of the most fun and enjoyable episodes that we recorded this season and also the most surprising. But you'll get what I mean when you watch it. I'll listen and understand what I mean by favourite child. (laughs) And Fletch, well, we all know there's something off about him even before we see him in full flight in the movie. J.K. Simmons uses behaviour, tone, physical violence and verbal abuse to create one of the all-time great villains. And we believe that Fletch is a psychopath without anyone mentioning it through the movie. And we know this because we feel it. So detecting subtext is about paying attention to what you're feeling when you watch a movie or read a book. And sometimes it takes a few goes to pinpoint exactly what's happening and why. But it's worth learning how to read your own reactions to what's going on. Now, Groundhog Day was interesting for me this season. I didn't expect much from this movie. But by paying attention to Phil's actions and the changes in his actions, I was able to pick up on the way the writers showed the change in him. And the Kubler-Ross Five Stages of Grief provided a framework to demonstrate what happens when someone is forced to change. So if you're stuck or looking for a way to convey the internal change via external action, then Kubler-Ross is a great concept to guide your character's actions. Finally, visual mediums like movies can present audiences with so many layers of subtext. And we've seen this in all the movies we've studied this season. And the standouts, because they were unexpected, were Skyfall, Back to the Future and Groundhog Day. Now, our job as writers is to use words to layer our stories. And I'm going to go through some of the ways to think about this shortly. So, Valerie, how did you find the focus on subtext this season? I found this fascinating this season the very first thing that caught my attention was when you showed us that subtext is more than just text, that it includes the sounds, the images, the colors, and all that kind of stuff. I'll be honest, until that moment, I'd only considered subtext as relating to the meaning beneath the text or the dialogue. So what you've done this season is really piqued my curiosity. Because of the nature of the podcast, We do movies because we can reasonably manage a movie a week and listeners can reasonably watch a movie a week and follow along with us. If we were doing novels to really do a full analysis, a proper analysis of a novel, it's like a full-time job for about three months. And I'm not exaggerating. It's huge amounts of work. Even if Melanie and I could do it every week, listeners to the show could not. (laughs) everyone would stop listening to the show. (laughs) So (laughs) now having listened to you talk about subtext in movies, I am really curious to apply everything that you've talked about to prose. Following from that, the other thing that stood out for me this season is when you said you talked about subtext as um, a setup. Now, this is also very rich territory to explore. And again, I want to go to novels now and have a look and see how or if novelists are using subtext this way. I honestly don't know the answer, but I'm curious to explore it. So for example, 
in our Home Alone episode, you talked about uh, when the camera, I think it was at the very beginning of the movie, when it was panning the McAllister's basement and all the things that we saw there and everything that that was setting up. Well, a camera pan is not something a novelist can do. <laughs> we have to very specifically draw a reader's attention to an item or a, an action or a person. And if we do that, there's got to be a reason, right? This is what this whole Chekhov's gun concept is about. So if we say there's a gun on the mantelpiece, and if we describe that to the reader, then that gun has got to go off at some point in the story. So really interesting. It's a, like you said, it's a very rich, fertile ground. I don't know how it will apply to prose, but I'm really looking forward to finding out. So Melanie, in all of your work that you've done this season, what's the one nugget of advice that you want to leave listeners with? Well, I think, um, well, there's heaps, but <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, you know, subtext is created through the associations readers give to the words that create images, tap into emotions and also meaning. So writers point the way, like you said, and they suggest, and they imply what the story is really about. Now, think about how you use the following in your stories so that you can see how you've embedded or not, or not embedded, subtext into what you're writing. And now think about settings, weathers and weather and seasons, the age of your characters, how your characters interact with family members by comparison to friends. What's your character's educational background? What are their skills, their talents, their abilities? You know, or what can't they do? What about the wealth of their char the characters? What's their religion or lack of religion? How do they gesture? What do they repeat, you know, over and over again? Think about those actions in relation to the genre. You know, when does the shadow come out in all of your characters and when does it not? How strong is it and how disproportionate is it? Think about denials, attitudes and cover-ups and also euphemisms when people don't say exactly what they mean, although the meaning is apparently clear. So audiences get a whole lot more information about what's really going on when they read the information and the details listed above. Dialogue alone will not provide your readers with everything they need to know. And if there's just one point that I want you to take away, it's subtext works best when it supports the story idea and the premise. Now this season, the best examples were in Skyfall, where the images and references about maternal relationships age, retirement and death were consistent through the movie and in Back to the Future where time was represented on a micro and macro level at every in every scene of the story. Right, that wraps up my exploration this season of subtext. I really love that list you gave us. I'm going to make a note of that and have that with me as I'm reading. Good job. Great. I'll send you, actually, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Yay. Yay. I'll okay. send it to you. Ooh, that would make a great social media post. <laughs> Keep an eye to my Instagram. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So this is the end of season four, if you can believe it or not. We're, we're at the end of another season. So next week we start season five. So Melanie, lay it on me. What are you going to study next season? Right. So season five, I'm going to study resonance. And resonance, as you will find out, is incredibly important because what we're going to be talking about is how stories, how through time we have grown to expect certain things from stories. And as an author, you need to tap into the things your readers want to read about and the feelings they want to feel in order to enjoy the stories that you're writing. So it's, again, another big topic, but one that's not talked about enough, and I'm super excited about studying it in Season 5. What are you going to do, Val? Melanie, I have so many questions for you about resonance. <laughs> you just, you have no idea, so hold on your hat. Gird my loins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
exactly. All right. So next season, I'm going to be studying something called plot structure. Now, I know that does not sound very sexy because chances are you don't even know what I'm talking about. That is not a failing in you. Believe me. Very few people talk about plot structure. It's just not in the theory books. Basically, what it is, is the shape of a story. Now, I get a lot of questions from writers who are asking about the structure of their plot, but they don't realize that that's what they're asking about, or they don't realize that the problem they're having is actually a problem with plot structure. So I'm hoping this is going to be a really useful season for everyone. And uh, you tune in. You never know. All right. <laughs> that wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we start season five and we discuss men in black. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. And if you'd like to find out about books that can help you read like a writer, visit me on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill Author or find out more about me at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.